Hello and welcome back to Pat Psychology Masters. I'm Pat McKeown and today I'm going to be talking about a really, really interesting perspective paper from Claire Kelly and Redmond O'Connell. Now Claire and Redmond are two fascinating researchers from Trinity College Dublin and they recently published a perspective paper in the journal Neuron which asked the question, can neuroscience change the way we view morality? I found this perspective paper absolutely brilliant and in this episode I'm going to be discussing some of the things from the paper which I found particularly fascinating. So let's begin by talking about the history of morality and moral decision making. So historically morality has been viewed as something that we kind of inherited from our forefathers or something that we were taught. We had different moral dictums like the Ten Commandments which told us how we ought to act. Now our understanding of morality is a lot more developed. Psychological research has informed how social factors, emotional factors and cultural factors, just to skim the surface, have a really important implication for how we make moral decisions. So take for example the social norm of reciprocity. If somebody does good by you, you're likely to reciprocate and do good by them also. Whereas if somebody screws you over, you're less likely to do good by them and you might be more likely to get them back. That's the social norm of reciprocity and that plays an important factor in our moral decision making. An example of an emotional factor would be inequity aversion. So generally speaking, we have this type of gut instinct that we don't like living in an unequal society and it doesn't matter where in that society you feature, whether you're the poorest of the poor, you don't like seeing a sort of stratified unequal society where some people have many, many gains and people like you have lots and lots of losses. And that's also true for the people on top, despite what I might have believed initially. Even the most successful, richest people have this inequity aversion and they don't like living in an unequal society. This inequity aversion also really informs our moral decision making. For an expanded discussion of how culture might affect our moral decision making, I highly recommend you check out my previous video in which I talk about lots of cultural factors and how they affect the self and the obvious implications that would have for our morality. But let's get back to the title of this paper. Can neuroscience change the way we view morality? In short, the answer is yes, it has and it will continue to do so. But there's an important message in this paper which tells us and other researchers how neuroscience could do even more than it's already done. Before I get to that, let's talk first about how neuroscience has contributed to the way we view morality at present. What I found particularly helpful about this perspective paper was how it illuminated the neural mechanisms that we have for decision making, given a few really good examples. And I'm going to provide the two examples which I found particularly fascinating. So to begin, number one, the trolley problem, and number two, rat empathy. But first off, we'll start with the trolley problem. Well, what is the trolley problem? For viewers who might be familiar with it, I'm just going to give a quick insight into what this problem is and how it's used in philosophy and psychological research. So the trolley problem presents a predicament to a person. Imagine there is a train track and on this train track is a large cart moving at speed. The train track splits into two. On one track, there is one person tied to the track and on the other track, there are five people tied down. Now, you are the track controller. You get to decide where that cart is going to go. Do you direct it towards the track with one person? Or do you direct it towards the track with five people? I'm guessing you, like most other people, will direct it towards the track with one person. That way, you're killing one person but also saving five. That's a pretty good outcome. But now let me modify the trolley problem a little bit. Now the track doesn't split. However, there's a bridge that goes over the track and you're standing at that bridge. You're not controlling any tracks anymore. You're just standing on that bridge and beside you is another person. 
This person is quite a large person. The track is approaching you, but behind the bridge, there are five people tied down to the track. Now, you're faced with a dilemma. Do you let the track go through the bridge, killing five people? Or do you push the large person off the bridge, sending them to their deaths, but stopping the cart just in time before it would reach five people? The dilemma's gotten a bit more tricky. This one involves the active murder of one person to save five. Would you do it? Two of the philosophical approaches that people can take when trying to answer this question are the utilitarian approach and the deontological approach. Utilitarianism would prioritise the outcome. What is the best outcome? Well, saving five people, that's the best outcome. That person standing beside you on the bridge, that's just one life. Their life is worth sacrificing for saving five. If I'm a utilitarian, that's the choice I'm taking. However, what about the deontological approach? Well, a deontologist will say, look, sometimes the ends are not justified by the means. Murder is wrong. I cannot murder this person, even if I'm going to save five people. That's not something I'm willing to do. And deontologically speaking, I'm not going to. I, will, I would rather be complicit in the death of those five people than murdering that one person. That act of murder is not something I'm willing to do. Now, interestingly, neuroscience research has shown us that there are different patterns of activation in the brain which correspond with whether you would take a utilitarian approach or a deontological approach. When compared with somebody who took the deontological approach, so someone who thinks that the end is not always justified by the means, a utilitarian person will demonstrate greater activation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which we know is involved in deliberative reasoning, and we will see weaker activation in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in emotional appraisal. Now the opposite is true for somebody who takes the deontological approach. They will have stronger activation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, so stronger activation of emotional appraisal, and lesser activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so lesser deliberative reasoning. Interestingly, we can make a person more or less likely to take one of these two approaches by disrupting these brain areas. And these brain areas can be disrupted using a technology called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which basically temporarily turns off a specific portion of the brain. So let's say by applying TMS to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we would make that person much more likely to make the deontological approach. So we would make them much more likely to not want to kill that person who's on the bridge with them. I found that immensely interesting. So that was the first example. What about rat empathy? Well, for this experiment, I want you to imagine two cages in which there are a rat in each. Both of these rats have little mini EEGs on their skulls, electroencephalograms. And these EEGs will detect the pattern of neural activity across their brain. Now, for one of these rats, we're going to administer them a shock. And the other rat is going to be able to observe this. When one of the rats is shocked, we can measure the neural activity across both the rats. Interestingly, we see a spike in activity in the observing rat's anterior cingulate cortex. The amplitude of this activity in the anterior cingulate cortex of the observing rat is directly proportional to the intensity of the shock that the other rat receives, that that other unfortunate rat who's getting shocked receives. This shows us that the observing rat can experience a form of empathy for his unfortunate cage mate. What I love about this experiment is it gives us a brilliant insight into how comparative neuroscience can inform our understanding of moral decision making. Because here we see empathy occurring in rats, 
perhaps morality isn't an exclusively human domain of inquiry. Perhaps other animals have a type of moral appraisal when presented with different stimuli. I think that's just incredibly interesting and it speaks to the idea of how a morality might have evolved over time. Now I alluded earlier to how Claire and Redmond had suggestions for how neuroscience could contribute much much more to our understanding of morality today. And their main suggestion was that we integrate neuroscience with the humanities. The approach of the humanities has a lot to offer neuroscience. In these two examples, it's very, very clear that they mightn't be what we term ecologically valid. Basically, they're not that really similar to real life. How often do you find yourself being faced with a very kind of stylized trolley problem? When do you find yourself on a bridge with five people tied to the track behind you? I hope you don't. And although rats are incredibly important models for research, they aren't humans. And let's just pretend they were humans for a moment. When do you ever find yourself in a cage watching your friend in another cage being shocked? Never. At least I hope you don't. So what Claire and Redmond call for are more naturalistic paradigms in which we use more normal everyday situations and storytelling. Storytelling is extremely prominent in the humanities. The humanities have realised that stories have a great potential for enacting human change. And this approach hasn't yet properly been adopted by neuroscientists. And that's what the authors encourage. Another extremely important quality of the humanities which it can offer to neuroscience is its inquiry into the widest domains of human experience. Neuroscience has a history of focusing on what some people term weird inquiry. Now weird is an acronym which stands for its focus on the inquiry of white, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic societies and those type of participants. Now obviously these type of participants don't represent the diversity we see in the world today. So this is something that the humanities can really offer the neurosciences. And it's unfortunate that we see these artificial barriers between the different domains of inquiry. Look at a university campus. We see the schools of biology, the school of arts, the school of psychology, the school of engineering. Why can't there be more integration between these different approaches? I think if that is accomplished, we will get a much, much better mode of inquiry and we'll get much, much better research being accomplished. And that's something that Claire and Redmond are strongly advocating for in this paper. Now, I do just have one point of contention with Claire and Redmond's perspective paper. They describe how we cannot and should not derive an ought from an is, as described from David Hume's ought from is problem. Basically, this problem states that we cannot say how we ought to act based on how we see things to be, based on how we observe the world to be. Personally, I take the perspective of neuroscientist and philosopher Sam Harris, who says we can in fact derive an ought from an is. Much like Sam, I think that the most remarkable and perhaps the most important thing about existence is the fact that some things and some people can feel conscious experience. I think that is just incredible. And if we are to behave in a particular way, that way in which we behave should move away from misery, move away from misery for us and for everything else that can have conscious experience. That is something that we ought to do. Now, ultimately, this is just a perspective of mine. It doesn't have to be an objective reality. And undoubtedly, further neuroscientific research will help me and the rest of us understand why I adopt this perspective and why re other readers of Hume might adopt a different perspective. So in this video, I hope I've convinced you of the importance of moral decision making. Morality bleeds into every aspect of our life. I cannot think of one decision that doesn't have some element of morality involved in it. 
it just is everywhere. I've provided examples of the trolley problem and rat empathy and how they've illuminated how the brain interacts with our sense of morality. And I've alluded to the importance that the authors place on integrating the humanities into neuroscience. Now importantly, watching this episode is not a proper replacement for reading their paper. And I'd highly recommend you check it out. The link is in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit thumbs up if you liked this video. Hit thumbs down if you didn't. Please subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you here next week.